Nearly three decades after the founding of the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, global warming still eludes our attempts to control it, to stop it, to predict it, even to wrap our heads around it. In my mind, it's a kind of fog, of carbon, of questions, of uncertainty, and perhaps we will not find our way through it until we acknowledge that it's a problem of rather unprecedented scale. Here's the simple question. What's the first thought or image that comes to your mind when you hear the words global warming? Now, I've asked that of a nationally representative sample of Americans over and over and over again, and it's incredibly revealing. I mean, I learned so much from this. I mean, it's to the point where I actually know what's inside people's head. I can be sitting at or standing in an airport line, and I can look at the you know, 100 people around me, and I can tell you, I can't tell you which people, but I can tell you what will be the most common image that comes to most people's minds. And the first thing that comes to many people is images of melting ice. How many people live on the shores of the Arctic Ocean, live in Antarctica, or live next to a melting glacier? And so what it does is those images also reinforce the false perception that climate change is far away. One of the main barriers that we have to public engagement is this sense that it's psychologically distant. That's partly distant in space, that this is something happening at the poles or far away, maybe in a developing country, but not where I live. And also the sense that it's distant in time. The challenge of envisioning climate change, a planet-wide phenomenon that stretches across an enormous physical scale, is compounded by the challenge of envisioning timescales that outlast human lifespans. It was actually life-changing for me when I started studying this because I realized that something like 20% of the carbon that every one of us emits today will still be in the atmosphere a thousand years from now. If we were to stop burning fossil fuels, something like 80% of the CO2 we've added to the system will get taken up by the oceans. But that'll happen over thousands to tens of thousands of years. So we have to understand that we are actually affecting the Earth's climate, not just for a century or two. We are fundamentally changing the Earth's climate for tens of thousands of years. Um, and frankly, we don't think about those timescales very well. The way we've organized ourselves, politically and economically, is to think mostly about the short term. If you're a member of Congress, you're only in office for two years, and then you have to run for re-election again. If you're a member of the Senate, you get six years. If you're a president, you get four years, okay? Those are very short time cycles. Um, so, you know, of course, you have an enormous incentive to think about what can I do for my constituents, or at least let them think that I'm doing for them, uh, in that short run when I'm going to be up for election again. Uh, it's even worse in the corporate world where, you know, many companies are, are literally looking at what is this shareholder report going to be in the next three months. Economists would say anything even 100 years out is worth nothing because of discounting. Um, well, the question is, if we are changing the surface of the earth in a profound way, not just for a few generations, but for tens of thousands of generations of humans, uh, does that matter? This is a moral problem. It's not just a scientific problem. I think that human beings are, are capable of a great deal of empathy, uh, but that there are lots of factors that get in the way of extending empathy across generations and across geographies. One of the moral challenges associated with caring for future generations, for the billions of future humans who will be affected by our decisions today, is that we can't see them. Knowing that something so vast lies beyond our vision is one of the unique challenges presented by a warming Earth in more ways than one. 
There's a lot of psychological issues that come into play around climate change, but one of the most basic and most important is that, uh, is that it's invisible. The carbon dioxide, the fundamental cause of this problem, is invisible. Since we care so much about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it's really important understanding the carbon cycle because the carbon cycle impacts how much of that carbon dioxide gas actually ends up being in the atmosphere and for how long. But not only is it in different places in the planet, it also moves from one thing to the next. So it's difficult to come up with that coherent picture. How carbon moves, where it lingers, and for how long, will determine how fast the planet warms. But the sheer scale of the carbon cycle, from tundra grasses sequestering carbon to the sea floor, where carbon is locked up as limestone, makes it hard to measure, model, and predict. Which is perhaps one reason why global geoengineering strategies, like spraying sulfur particles in the upper atmosphere, have been met with skepticism. Should we further tamper with a system we do not entirely understand? Historically, the engineering imagination has always been associated with thinking it can accomplish more than it can. Over and over again, we've judged systems to be simpler than they really are. We're doing such a big experiment to the Earth system by burning so much fossil fuel that it's, of course, important to understand every aspect of the Earth system that we can. But at the same time, this is fundamentally driven by our use of fossil fuels, and it's that that we ultimately have to solve if we're going to fix this problem. None of the other things will matter if we don't solve that problem. It turns out that replacing the energy infrastructure that's more than 80% dependent on fossil fuels with non-fossil sources of energy is going to be very difficult, and it involves uh, infrastructure that's expensive. Now, can we afford it? Absolutely, because it's a whole lot better than letting climate change happen. But let's not fool ourselves. We're talking about, just for the U.S., something like tens of trillions of dollars of infrastructure that are required. And it's going to take a long time. If you just think about it in terms of how much stuff you need to build, the timescales are centuries at least. And so this isn't a problem that we can solve in 20 years even if we had the political will to do it. That's what, to me, is so daunting. Even when you have a president who recognizes the scientific consensus on climate, the massive costs involved and the question of who should pay for what make international negotiations complicated. For a long time, these negotiations were stalled and really mired in this dynamic that developing countries felt that they should be able to develop in the same manner that developed countries like the United States um, and Europe had done, which is to say in a fossil fuel intensive way. The genius and the brilliance of how the Paris Agreement came together lies in countries like the United States offering finance for climate resilience and for the energy transition that needs to happen around the world and other economies. That being said, the Trump administration has already pledged to dismantle President Obama's climate action plan. It's fair to say that no one really knows the extent to which we will go back on our promises under Paris, the extent to which the rest of the world will say, oh well, uh, we're still going to lead on this issue, it's critically important, or the extent to which the rest of the world will say, look, we're really looking to the U.S., and if the U.S. isn't going to act, why should we? I think the climate problem is often misunderstood because on the science side of it, people have taken it to be unproblematically global, and people often say this is a global issue, has to be handled at the global level. But I think people lose sight of the fact that all the actors that are going to be doing the handling don't necessarily think of themselves as being global at all. You know, it's fine for us to take a problem like climate and bump it up to the global scale, but we don't have global governance. We don't have an institution that's responsible 
for the planet. We have no idea politically what that would even look like. And a lot of people would be very suspicious, Americans above all, at the idea of government being taken away from their localities and being put somewhere else. Climate is not going to yield to moonshots. I think that the climate problem is intrinsically different. It's going to require action of many different kinds at an, and at many different levels. Answering the challenge of a warming Earth in an era when elected leaders deny the science and drag their feet may require a true diversity of approaches at a variety of different scales. And when we're mired in the fog of uncertainty over what the future will look like, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that these approaches are already underway. We have done a far better job over the years of helping people understand the problem than we have the solutions. There's really an amazing amount of innovation and creativity and inspiration going on uh, uh, everywhere, but we just don't see it because we don't tell those stories. So it's the solution stories that are desperately needed. If it was science that alerted us to the scale of climate change, it might be stories shared and multiplied across the world that allow us to scale up our response to the issue, or perhaps more accurately, our responses to it. And the stories about these new approaches to managing carbon harnessing the sun's energy, or envisioning new political strategies will help us grapple with the complexities of a warming world. Solution stories have a way of showing a path forward, like lights in a slowly but steadily dissipating fog.